Welcome to Onward Live, a live stream focused on encouraging you to create a life you love living now. Let's go beyond success to significance. Being clear on our why is crucial. It requires doing the inner work, finding ourselves, getting to know ourselves, embracing our inner child, shedding social conditioning, and letting go of perfect. We know obstacles make us stronger. We can dream big and take action. Believe you can, and you're halfway there. I invite you to tune in every week and engage with me and my inspiring guests. Invite your friends. Let's make time for what matters most in our lives. Let's move onward together. Hi, everybody. I was just kind of cracking up because I saw that one of the last pictures and it's of my grandson, Marshall. He's like five and you know how it is when a five-year-old doesn't want to be in the picture and he's like <laughs> looking all kind of stressed out. We're trying to say smile, uh, but that doesn't always work with little kids. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me tonight and my guest. Um, I appreciate you guys for joining and I wanted to start this episode first with talking a little bit about Ukraine, and it's just very short. Um, there, there's a website there where you can uh, make a donation. So I got this email from Restream. Restream, the owner, the head of Restream. Restream is this platform that I'm using right now to stream this show because you can't stream directly. You can't just go live on LinkedIn. You need to have something that you can stream. So I got this email that said, my name's Alex, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Restream. I'm also a father, a husband, and above all today, a proud Ukrainian. He sent this Friday, February 25th. As you likely already know, yesterday, Russian forces conducted airstrikes across Ukraine, and including his hometown, where uh, Andrew, a friend of his, and, and he founded Restream in 2015. So in the last 24 hours, he said in this email, they'd received an outpouring of support from friends, colleagues, and many inquiring about the safety of their team and ways they can help. So basically, they got everybody from their team um, out of Ukraine or is at least safe. And they have a website, which I'm sharing right here that you can go to. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that are on the ground in Ukraine that you can donate to. So I just wanted to share that as we kick off this episode. So hi, everybody, Charlene, Bill, Kenny D, Jenny, thank you guys for joining. Uh, Martino, I haven't met you before. So thank you for joining. So tonight we're talking about a, a tough topic. So if if you get triggered by the converse, a conversation on suicide, I just wanted to let you know up front that that's what we're talking about, mental health, suicide, and just wanted to let you know up front in case uh, it might trigger you. So the topic tonight is don't, I don't know how to say this, Jeff, don't effing kill yourself, <laughs> a memoir, memoir of suicide survival and stories that keep us alive. And my guest tonight is Jeff Romick, and I'm going to bring him in right now. Let's see. There we go. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for hey, joining. Emily. Thanks for Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm, and yeah, I'm, the, I'm, the title, the title, I usually just go with whatever, the, however the host wants to, <laughs> to, say, to say it. <laughs> well, so. I think my episode is clean. So I guess that's how I, uh, I'll say don't effing kill yourself. A memoir yeah. of suicide survival and stories that keep us alive. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why yeah. you wrote this book? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the title isn't just intended to be an eye catcher. It's actually a story um, about 10 years ago. Um, a friend asked me if I could only say one more thing to my dad, what would I say? And the title of my book was my answer. And my dad died by suicide. Um, on February 24th, 1996, I was 18, just turned 18 a few weeks before. Um, 
And so I've been a suicide survivor from the loss of a loved one, you know, for 26 years now. Um, but I also inherited the same mental health struggles that, um, that, that he had and, or that I believe he had, he wasn't diagnosed. He didn't seek help. Um, but based on his final act and, um, the insights we have from the letters he left us, um, and, and my own struggles, um, you know, I, I believe he struggled with the same things. And, you know, that's for me, that's, I'm diagnosed generalized anxiety and clinical depression. And then, um, you know, I have my own suicidal ideation. And so I decided to write the book um, for a couple of reasons. I think first and foremost, um, to share my story as some, you know, as a kid who lost a parent to suicide, um, to give insight to that, but then also, you know, insight to what does it look like when you leave a kid behind um, and they grow up? <laughs> um, and then the other side to give insight into, you know, what is it like to be, um, you know, in my, from my standpoint, I'm, I can only tell my story, um, you know, a young, a pretty high functioning younger professional for most of my, my life to date in the professional world, I'm 44. So, um, so most of my time in the, in the workforce was kind of a young professional. Um, but how, you know, how I navigated, how I've navigated my own mind, um, you know, it's our LinkedIn profiles don't convey what, whatever we deal with, um, from a mental health standpoint, from a trauma standpoint. Um, and so it's, you know, we, we want our, we want our work to jump out and to say something about us, but you know, it's also what's in between the lines of the lines on our resume that, you know, make us who we are and, you know, navigating the pressure of, you know, of the young professional world and, um, you know, it's part of my story and part of, you know, my thirties was a lot of, you know, trying to prove myself because I couldn't prove myself to my dad and, you know, it wasn't healthy for me and it played into, you know, it played into a lot of, um, you know, everything tracing back to not only his, his suicide, but, you know, but growing up too. Um, so I, I had the idea for the book a few years back, um, but I definitely needed, I needed to live a little more life and um, got sober in 2017. And I, and I'm now over four years sober. And, you know, it really was the tools that I got that I found through, through AA based sobriety that, you know, positioned me to even be able to do this. Cause it's not, it's not just a writing project. It's a really, you know, an emotional project. <laughs> and so it took a lot and took a lot out of me. Um, but I decided on Father's Day in 2020, as we were a few months into the pandemic, um, I'm, I'm single, divorced a few years ago in 2015 and, and live alone. And, you know, I on Father's Day, I was just, that was my 25th fatherless Father's Day. And I just thought, you know, as I'm in isolation, how do I keep my myself healthy and, you know, and do a project that I've wanted to do. And I think also somebody on some in the Zoom call had said something like, if you're a writer and you don't come out of quarantine with a book, what were you doing? <laughs> and so <laughs> sort of all, all of those things together, and this is my, first, there, my yeah. first my first book, but sort of all of those things together you know, come as I was coming up on the 25th anniversary, it just really landed in my head that, you know, I have this story I want to tell um, to help people who struggle with suicide, suicidal ideation as a core reader. And then sort of the next, the next group, you know, people who love those people and, and how to have some insight and have some tools um, and just, you know, started, started writing um, the, the way I approach the book kind of plays with time. It's not told in a linear fashion. It's, um, 
one of the original ideas was I was very haunted by my dad did the carbon monoxide in the car thing. And I was haunted by, you know, it takes, a, based on my research, it takes about five minutes, depending on the concentration of the carbon monoxide to lose consciousness. And so mm-hmm. I was always haunted by like, what was he thinking in those five minutes and, and why wasn't it enough um, to, to change his mind? Um, and then you combine, combining that idea with the idea that our lives flash before our eyes when we're about to die. And, you know, and, and I thought about what did he see, but also what would I see? And so, you know, basically the book is, is my memoir and is, um, each chapter is based around a date. And then, you know, there's a story arc but the dates are not in, not in chronological order. Um, Understand. Yeah. They, they jump around and, you know, and, and not all of them are, I mean, it's a memoir, it's not a self-help book. So all of them aren't darkness, you know? Um, and what I found as I was writing, one of my first editors kept asking me, um, a brilliant guy kept asking me, why are you telling me this specific story? And I, and I was so annoyed with the question at first, but then, that it, it really, that question helped me frame not only the approach to the book, but what, but the key tool um, from the book, which is these are the people, passions, and experiences that have brought me joy. And in my darkest moments, in my very darkest, almost close to suicide moment in 2017, it was remembering those things and the possibilities that existed that that pulled me through that moment and so you know these are the stories that i want to remember um because they bring me joy or because they bring me perspective because they remind me of the people that love me and that want me to stay here um and so that's what you know that's what the the book is 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 a, a a memoir of suicide survival and the stories that keep us alive. Um, so let me ask. So, so congratulations, Bill says, and I do thank too you. on your sobriety. Thank um, you. That's about as long as my son's been sober too. And awesome. Um, congratulations I, to him. Yeah. And thank you. And I've seen well for him. I say, thank you. I've seen him grow and, heal through what he learned when he was, you know, getting sober. And so it sounds like this writing this book was healing for you as well. Absolutely. No yeah. question about it. I mean, that to, to the degree that the ending of the book changed because of my growth through the process. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think it's, you know, one thing I discovered is I'd done a lot of grief work um from a few angles but i hadn't really done trauma work and they're two different journeys and Mm -hmm. you know and and so i felt like you know before i started the book i felt like you know it's been 25 years almost i should be in a better place but but i hadn't even done any of the work with the trauma um i had done the work with the grief um Mm -hmm. and so this you know this book really helped me um, navigate the trauma. And again, see my dad as a guy that was struggling. I mean, I'm, you know, I turned 44 just a few weeks ago in February. Um, I was 43 when I wrote the book. He was 47 when he died. And there you go. You can relate a little differently now that you're older, right? You can see he's not just a dad, he's a person. He had thoughts too. He's not a perfect person. Yeah. Yeah. And and I also think about like, I was diagnosed in 2002. So I've had a diagnosis and, you know, therapy most of that time, meds most of that time. And it's still been a, a struggle. I can't imagine he didn't have that. He, right? he dealt with having none of that, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's a different kind of perspective and a different kind of empathy, you know. And I think, you know, from a from a sobriety standpoint, and not seeing everything be, as being about me, you know. I think for so long it was just all about me, and I was the victim. And you know, but the more that I've learned about you know, his, his life, 
you know, he might have been a victim too. And, and, you know, and it just, he was trying to do his best. He wasn't trying to victimize anyone, you know, uh, no, yeah. he was, he was just upside down in his head because the reality is the longer that suicidal ideation stays in your head, the more poisonous it gets. And so that's oh, why, wow. and that's why I have to, that's why I'm encouraging people to share more and I'm sharing my story um, in depth. And then I have the podcast Suicide Survival Stories to give opportunities for other folks to share their, their story. As well, well. How does sharing the story help, help you? The, and does sharing the story keep you from, from suicide? Yes, because I'm because I'm here, um, and I, I don't say that in a glib way, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it is. It's just like, you know, it's like if your your cup fills up, and it's going to overflow if it keeps filling, and that's sort of how how it is with suicidal ideation. And you know, the the more in your head you are, without both hearing yourself out loud and potentially, you know, hearing another person reflect back to you about what you've said you know, you can just get upside down and you can think, you know, it's like a, it's like a pilot flying with instruments and the instruments are telling him one thing and then he comes in for landing and he's, he's flying upside down because the instruments are off. And, you know, when I read my dad's suicide letter, cause he, you know, he talks about finances and that, that was his, um, you know, that was what he said. And, um, to him, it was all very logical, and this is how he could take care of his family. And um, he wasn't correct. It wasn't a good idea. But to him, it was logical because he didn't bounce it off anybody else. And he yeah. didn't even hear himself say it out loud. Um, and I doubt until he sat down to write those letters, he ever put anything on paper because he wasn't one. He was a lawyer. But. He wasn't one to journal or talk about his feelings or anything like that. So right. I don't I don't think those thoughts ever came out of his mind until he was literally had had decided what he was doing and was checking off his list of what he needed to do, you know, to to leave. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have a younger brother. Um he's about to turn 40. He was 13, or I guess he was 12 about to turn 13 and he was in eighth grade. I was a senior in high school. And so, um, yeah, he's, he's a literal rocket scientist. Now he, he does wind turbine work for general electric. Um, <laughs> I got all the humanities, history, political science writing. Um, and he got, he got all the math and science. So. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So oh, there was a question that I had right at the top of my head. Um, which is like, so when you get in that state where you're just thinking of thinking about it, how do you get yourself out of it? What, what are your steps? Yeah. I mean, I, my steps now are, I mean, I, I, I think if I'm being honest about my own suicidal ideation, where I've come th through the process of writing the book is I have learned how not to die, but I'm still learning how to live, if that makes sense. And so I definitely find myself in these spaces when my depression is kind of um, winning, where I feel worthless and hopeless, but I'm not suicidal. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't think about suicide in general. There's a difference between, and I think that's something that, people who, who have suicidal ideation, like there's a difference to having suicidal ideation and being suicidal. Um, What's the difference? And I mean, the difference is you're, you're formalizing, you know, you're formalizing a plan. I mean, when you're suicidal, you're, you know, you are on your way to the act as opposed to envisioning the act in a theoretical way. Um, but not taking action on it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... I have not been suicidal since I got sober. And so, you know, my program and then my commitment to sharing about 
my my story, my mental health journey, my own suicidal ideation, um, you know, keeps me from getting to that darkest place. Um, so it's you know, it's the work to to not get there. It's the you know, it's the mowing the lawn, weeding the garden, you know, the maintenance, the mental health maintenance um, keeps has kept me from getting to that point. Um, you know, but that's also different, you know, different for everybody. And so yeah. that's where, you know, I try to share what works for me. And if it works, I, I'm not sharing it as a panacea or as a silver bullet. I'm just sharing it as sharing the, you know, sort of the three things I talk about um, that you can add to your own toolbox. And, you know, but it's, they're not, you know, everything and they work for me right now but maybe in a year i need another tool right and so it's interesting and that i didn't plan this but last week my guest was a mom who's who lost her son 12 years ago to suicide um so sorry march and then and then i have you and it wasn't even planned and then this week is or within this past week which is week when the stanford soccer player yeah did I suicide. and one of the things that I learned from last week's interview is that suicides tend to happen the most in the spring, which I didn't know. Uh, I, I thought it would be like winter time, but it's in yeah. the spring. I didn't know that either. And she said that's because, I mean, I don't know, I don't know exactly why, but she said, yeah, it's like March, April, May, June, that time frame is when most, um, of them happen. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I just would have thought it would have been uh, winter. How do you, yeah. how do you handle it when you hear in the news, you know, like the soccer player, how does that impact you? Um, I will answer that question from a pre book and a post book standpoint, pre book. I took those opportunities um, to share and to speak. Um, post book, I have not, um, I don't want it to ever seem like I'm trying to capitalize on those opportunities to sell a book. Cause I'm absolutely not. I didn't do this in any fashion to, to make any money. And, you know, um, so it's not about that for me, but I think it's, so I think now my role is to share in between you know, and when when there's a tragedy that involves suicide, it will be shared um, and people will will share a little more. And I feel like my duty now is to share in between at moments when, you know. Maybe it's, it's just, not on the forefront of people's right. Mind or yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's, that's yeah. how I've dealt with that. Yeah. Okay. Mark says, how good is society at recognizing a symptom before people get to the point? Like, I know one Terrible. of the things I learned last week is, you know, you, you can ask, are you thinking of committing suicide? That's a question that we should ask, right? Yeah. Don't and we want to say, and just, just a note, we want to say die by suicide die rather by than suicide. commit because commit implies that you're, you're, in the midst of a crime, which obviously murder suicides are, um, mm -hmm. but suicide isn't a crime. And so we don't want to criminalize mm -hmm. uh, people who die by suicide. So we've, we've in the, in the community, we've tried to move more toward die by suicide. So not, not to be, you know, no, I'm critic, glad you but just, that out. just to bring I'm that like, up. Yeah. But I mean, that, that would, yeah. to me would be like an awkward question to ask somebody, are you thinking about, Dying by suicide. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, I think the answer to the question, the one word answer is terrible. Society does a terrible job. But I think, but it's such a mix of things. Um, mm -hmm. And and again, it takes a, it's a toolbox. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. I mean, even yeah. when people are like, you know, reach reach out to your people if you're struggling, you know, that's really hard <laughs> when you're, when you're, you know, paralyzed by depression, it's really hard to reach out. But on the other end of that, like when it comes down to it, 
if you're about, if you are planning and in the act of taking your own life, you are more than likely alone and have to, and if you're going to get through it, it's, it's your own wherewithal at that point. Um, so it's like when, when people say, you know, if you're struggling, reach out. I mean, it sort of goes both ways. It's like, you know, it's incumbent upon me when I'm struggling to try to push myself to reach out, but it's also incumbent upon people who care about me, who know that I struggle to not get disconnected because, you know, my depression backs me into a corner where it's safer for me to isolate. Um, and so sometimes I need to find the strength to reach out and, and other times having people reach out to me reminds me that, you know, people care about me and it's easy when you're isolating to, to tell yourself that they don't. So it sort of goes, those are both tools, right? Like it's not, it's a yes. And like, I need to reach out and people who know I struggle if they haven't heard from me in a while or they, or I post something on social that they're concerned about, like, you know, they should reach out. So it's, it's a yes. And it's not one or the other. That's a really good point because I mean, I'll just say, you know, you, you started off with saying that a lot of times our social media posts don't reveal everything. I've been connected to some people on LinkedIn that are really sharing some, some deep mm -hmm. experiences. I haven't shared as many, but I will share that I do get depressed. And I, and I tend to get depressed when I like leave my comfort, when not leave my comfort, when I go on a trip. So I was on a trip and I was around a lot of people. I had to speak an event and I came home and I just, when it's, when I get out of my routine and that weekend, I slept just about the whole weekend. This is just a few weeks ago. And it felt like two hands were on my shoulders keeping me down i went out because i had to to take my dog out to pee because i had to do that mm -hmm. but reaching out for help when you feel like that or to just talk to somebody you don't feel like talking to anybody yeah so it like you said when they say reach out for help when you're feeling like that it's very hard to reach out for help and what somebody can say i'll kind of snap out of it come on let's let's yeah. go do something they, if you haven't felt like that depression or that weight on your shoulders. And I haven't felt is, you know, thinking about suicide. I haven't been there, but if you haven't been there, it's really hard to understand. Yeah. And, and that brings to the next piece of like, why don't people reach out because they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily feel capable of what they might, of dealing with what they might hear, you know, and I think that's the other thing. When we reach out, um, you know, we have to make sure that we're very intentional about not making it about us as the one that's reaching out. So I say that from the perspective of of the friend, not you know, if I reach out to somebody and they're struggling, I need to make sure that I don't make it about me and that mm -hmm. I let them let them navigate it and only all I can do is remind them that I care and that I'm there. And if they don't want to talk any more than that, I can't do anything. You know, um, I had that exact situation with, with a friend this past weekend who's struggling and, um, you know, he knows that I struggle. Um, and we were together and I, I said, you know, cause he took a leave, um, and is to, to, to tackle what he's struggling with. And I said, you know, I'm always here to talk, whatever you need. Um, and, you know, he's not ready to be in that place. And so, but I hope he knows now that like, you know, maybe he'll remember that more and maybe he'll he'll text me or, or whatever. Um, but I hope that I reinforced him that I care, you know, and that mm -hmm. that's, you know, that he's, he's you know, not alone. Um, because again, we can't, and I think that, again, this is another sobriety thing. Like we don't try to get other people sober. If people want to get sober, they have to want to get sober. And no matter what we want, what we think we should do, it's not, you know, it's, it's not going to work until, until someone is coming on their own merits. And it's, it's I'm similar, smiling right? Because I, 
I learned that with my son because <laughs> yeah. I tried to do everything to help him. And it wasn't until he decided. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's similar. And, and the more that we can, as friends or family, the more that we can approach mental health with that, you know, we're not trying to fix you or save you. We just love you and care about you and, and are here for whatever you need. And when, when you need it, you know, we're here. And that's, so I try to approach that the same way I try to approach sobriety resources. You know, if a friend calls and says, you know, I, I'm, cause I'm, I'm very open about my story and my sobriety. Um, and I, so I've had friends reach out to me that have said, I don't know if I'm, I don't know that I want to go to AA and I don't know that I'm an alcoholic, but, um, I feel like I'm drinking too much. And, you know, I basically say, I'm here to talk. If you want resources, I can share them, mm -hmm. um, you know, because again, it's not my, it's not my decision to decide if somebody is or isn't an alcoholic. I mean, that's right. where, that is only them. That is as an alcoholic, nobody can tell me I am or that I'm not, um, you know, and, but I had, I had to decide that I was going, that I didn't want to keep on that path, um, and, and make that change. And, um, and I know that the resources are there for me. Um, it's, it's harder with, I think it's harder to a degree with depression, um, because it's, um, it's hidden in, in a lot of ways. Um, and you, you know, but I think the best way to be empathetic is to make sure that you're not making it about you and make sure that you're just, you know, doing what you can and letting them know that you care. Um, great tips. Mark, um, James said that it took getting CO poisoning for him to wake and see life. Thanks for sharing that, James. And uh, we have a couple other um, comments here. Let's see. Mark Lee says, uh, sometime friends who are in hard times want you to talk to them and encourage them to live. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, then, and I think you have to follow their energy, right? Like if they're in a, you know, and so if it's, they're going to give you the openings to proceed. And so you just kind of have to take it step by step and, you know, listen to your own intuition about how you feel in that moment, because but but even the act of engaging them shows them that you want them to be alive. Yeah. And Mark says that disconnection is something we have to work on. It's easy to separate yourself from your friends and allies. And then mm -hmm. um, he has a question for you. Has media sometimes over romanticized depression? One of the biggest holiday specials is it's a wonderful life. And that's really about suicide. I, that's a good question. I don't know that I have a good answer to it. Um, I think whether, I think the reality is, is there's two, there's two very distinct type of depressions. There's depression that's acute and situational, and then there's depression that's clinical and chronic. Um, and so I think, I don't think whatever the media does or doesn't do as a former journalist and as a member of the media, um, and a past member of the media, um, I don't think what they do or don't do has any effect on chronic depression. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, it certainly, it certainly could have an effect on, um, situational depression. Absolutely. You know, for sure. And Andrew says, I hear you. I was there too. I hope it's okay that I share this as it might help someone too. I created a video on how to overcome negative thinking, depression, or suicidal thoughts. And it includes the seven reasons not to kill yourself too. Um, and it's hard for me. Let's see. I'd have to unhide this to show the whole, it's hard for me to see the whole uh, message here, but he's got it in the comments. Yeah, here it is. It includes the seven reasons not to kill yourself too. It'll show you the way the first step and others that that helped him to get out of the trap. So anyway, that's great. Um, and thank you, Andrew. And, and again, I think it's, it really is about build, you know, building a community toolbox of, of different tips and different insights. And because I think the reality is we, we need medical professional resources. Those are 
essential to be out there. Um, but we also need, you know, more qualitative tips from just normal, you know, normal people that struggle. Um, yeah. And so, you know, for me, it's kind of the three, the three things that I share um, are first and foremost, share and share often be as be as open about your story and your struggle, uh, you know, as you as you can be. Um, and the second one is connect with your people, passions and experiences, you know, from your life. And then and then the last one, you know, the title of the book, Don't F and Kill Yourself, is also a mantra. You know, it also can be used as a mantra of, you know, I've I've been trying, I've tried the first two things. And if I'm if I've done those and I'm still spinning, you know, it's a mantra to say. Uh, yeah. Again, it's you know, it's not a panacea, but I think it's, you know, I hope that it can go in a community toolbox with other things um, that that might connect. Um, well, and, um, you know. let's see. Um, Mark says, Andrew, sure, Emily would like to share your story. I did. I interviewed Andrew already, and um, but we didn't talk about um, about what he just posted. And his episode's out, and I am going to be posting about it tomorrow. I hadn't told you yet, Andrew, that your episode came out as a regular podcast. But um, so you know, when you when you scheduled this interview, my podcast theme was facing adversity, moving mm -hmm. forward, and discovering ourselves along the way. And you could probably oh, yeah. see that I've changed the theme a little bit to create a life you love living. So mm -hmm. how? What would you, how do you live? How do you live so that you love your life or can you, do you? I can, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm learning. I think, you know, the book was such a journey and, you know, I wrote it in about five months and it was a lot of emotional work. Um, you know, the, the rest of the time before it came out was editing and design and all that stuff. Um, but I, I think I'm still learning and even it came out in November and I also needed to kind of catch my breath from that. And, um, you know, it's, I, I'm a nonprofit fundraiser and I used to be a political consultant and I left my pat, my most recent nonprofit fundraising job, um, to go to a startup political firm and do some strategic communications last fall. And it just didn't, it wasn't a fit. And, you know, I think part of of getting healthier, you know, through sobriety and through the process of the book allowed me to say, like, it's not a fit. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move on. And um, and so the last few months for the first time in a privilege, a very privileged professional life where I've moved seamlessly for 20 years, 20 plus years from opportunity to opportunity. Um, you know, I was doing a full job search and not, not employed. And that was, you know, I have made work so much a part of my life. Um, my sponsor tells me and has told me for three years, like you make work your higher power, you let your life revolve around work and, and you put so much of your self worth into that. Um, you know, and he, as I was going through this job search, he said, you know, maybe, maybe this is. Your higher power giving you some space to to live a life without without that work so that you can be better at those boundaries when you when you find your next spot and um interviewing really started ramping up in january um and connected with a, a nonprofit here in atlanta that is fantastic and um, got hired as their director of individual giving and started with them this Monday. And so, you know, now that I'm, you know, kind of back in my happy fundraising place with a nonprofit whose mission I believe in and connects to work I've done in the past, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting that path to build, you know, the life that, that I envision. This is the first time I've really started, um, a nonprofit job with the tools that I've I've built in sobriety yeah. and through building through doing the book over the last four years. And um, you know, I'm excited to bring that to, you know, to my work and, you know, but also create some more boundaries and um in in separating work and 
non-work life and you know and not putting all of my self-worth into into the professional side of things and so i think those that's how i've i don't think i'm living the life that i want to live yet but i think i'm starting and i think i have the tools to do that whereas four years ago i absolutely um didn't have the tools at all that's I mean, great, I, it's great awareness though so many people yeah. stick in a job that they don't really love that doesn't give them energy and um that's awesome that you were able to re recognize that and say, you know, it's not a fit and not, not that that means that you're a failure or you're, you know, whatever yeah. you're, that's a success to recognize it's not a fit and go and find something that really is. Congratulations. Totally. On that. Well, thank you. And I, yeah, I just, you know, I had past success in politics and I, I thought I wanted to look at that again and I missed fundraising so much mm -hmm. that it showed me, you know, fundraising is a way for me to really use my skill set of storytelling and strategy and engagement and, um, you know, and I just miss that. And so it's like I was able to recognize there's nothing wrong with this firm. There's nothing wrong with the vision here or the people here or the work here. It's just not what I want to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't sit there for six months. Um, you know, beating myself up or projecting onto other people or making it all about me and and creating drama and all that. Um, you know, I just made a, made a call and, um, and now I'm in, in the right place. So I'm excited. Yeah. And Bill says there are a lot of great people here to connect with. And that's for sure. So if you when you're when we're done with this, I highly recommend you go through the comments and connect yeah. with people and connect with people that they know. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of people here that really talk about um, radiating real is the hashtag cool. that Nancy Barrows started. And it's, you know, sharing the not so great things that we're experiencing and that we're feeling and that we're going through and supporting mm -hmm. each other through that. So I highly recommend and anyone who's listening to this as a podcast when it's published later, connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with Jeff on LinkedIn and yeah. let's kind of yeah. let's help each other out and check in on each other and, and support each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's also emblematic of how LinkedIn has changed over the past five years or so where, you know, I think, I think five years ago it was pretty buttoned up and I see way more people sharing their whole selves here, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think through the pandemic, especially, with i mean i think parents are the mvps of the pandemic i i can't imagine having to you know keep all the professional balls in the air and do homeschooling and all of that and, but i also but i do think it has shown everybody that disconnecting our our work from you know having these sort of two silos um isn't feasible and, and i think from that lens on LinkedIn, I've definitely seen more high performing executive types and the folks that are striving to be those, get those jobs, being vulnerable and being authentic and sharing, um, you know, sharing more about themselves than just, just the business side. And I think that's great. Yeah. I went live one day cause it was back in, I think it was October. My pottery teacher died. Um, sorry. unexpectedly and I went live there it's on YouTube you can find it and I'm just like bawling and I shared it on LinkedIn um, on the social media because what I was so frustrated about is that I, I have pictures of pottery and and stuff but I didn't really get to know him really deeply and I don't have any picture of me and Phil or even a picture mm -hmm. of Phil and it just helped me awaken me to, you know, even how I want to even more enjoy relationships with people. And that's one of the reasons yeah. that I retired from working for the Navy at my minimum retirement age is because I was miss I was feeling like I was so busy. I was missing these deep conversations or just getting to know people more than just saying hi. And yeah. I feel I felt like I didn't do that well enough with Phil, but he was just such an amazing person. And um, so, yeah, I mean. I'm not embarrassed that I was crying and I, th th that's life, right? Yeah, we, totally. And that is important. 
Yeah. So um, thanks, Bill, for joining. And uh, he looks forward to connecting with you. There you go. Thanks, you got Bill. a new friend. <laughs> you got a new friend. So yeah, anybody who's watching, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to happy to make new new virtual friends. Yeah, it's awesome. And you live in Atlanta. I do. Yeah. So what have we, I'm looking at my notes here. What about your mom? I haven't heard you mention your mom. Oh, my mom's great. I mean, she's, you know, kind of the rock of our family. It's, it's funny. I, I don't have a book right here with me, but um, the way that the cover of, of the book is a picture of my family from when I think I'm probably like seven or so. Um, but it, it continues onto the spine and my mom is like on the spine. And so, <laughs> yeah, and I didn't, you know, when we were doing the art and stuff, we were really just looking at the front. Um, and so until I got the book in my hand, I really didn't see the spine. Um, and, you know, when I when I gave her the, the hard copy, I told her like, you know, this is, I think it's appropriate that you're on the spine because, you know, you're, you held everything together and, you know, and she did. And I, you know, I was on my way to college. We had literally gone to visit the University of Alabama where I spent my first two years before coming back to Columbia and going to the uh, University of South Carolina. Um, we visited Alabama the weekend before my dad died. And, you know, I was pretty, pretty set to go there, both because that's what I wanted to do. And I, I was ready to leave Columbia, but also because that's the last thing that he knew I wanted. And I felt like I needed to follow through with that. So, you know, six months after he died, I was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And, you know, my mom and my brother were for, for two years in Columbia. I mean, we had our, our extended family, of course, but, um, you know, she really held our family to our, you know, core family together and helped put me through college and, you know, all of, all of, all of that. So, you know, she's... I commend your mom. I, I don't, I, I don't have a exact same circumstance, but I am, um, the only parent surviving of my two children. Their dad died, um, in 2019. And there's a certain yeah. kind of, I don't know, pressure you feel to be able to stay around. I want to stay healthy. And you're the only yeah. parent that your kids have. And it's, a. Uh, it's a lot. It's a big responsibility. So congratulations yeah. to your mom for pulling through. Yeah, that and absolutely. And I, you know, and I think that's where, you know, I know that I wasn't, you know, I was a kid and I, I, I was appreciative, but not, you know, I didn't understand at the time, you know, because she was dealing with her own grief and her own trauma and then being strong for us and making sure that we had what we needed. Um, you know, with, with Brian in high school and me in college and, um, and making sure, you know, getting him to college, you know, obviously he was, he's a rocket scientist. He's super smart, yeah. but just make, <laughs> making sure he, you know, he had the resources to make the college choices that he wanted to make and, um, you know, and without loans and things like that. And so, um, yeah, she's, she's always been great. She's, she got remarried in 2007 and she and her husband, um, live in Columbia and South Carolina. And it's, it's been great to see them more in the past year, you know, as opposed to 2020, where I think I only saw them once. And it was like, for 30 minutes, sitting 10 feet away from each other. And, you know, and then obviously, we didn't do Thanksgiving or Christmas. And it was hard. Yeah. It was a hard year, obviously, for everybody. But it was I want you to know, ask 20, you 21 that. was nicer. Yeah, 21 yeah, was nicer to be able to be together. I bet. Uh, so Mark Lee says he's looking forward to connecting with you. He's just up the road in North Carolina and he has cousins oh, cool. in Georgia. And um, great, Mark. And then uh, Charlene has to go. Thank you for watching, Charlene. So let me ask you a question. Like you, COVID happened, kind of, you were writing the book, which is traumatic during COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're secluded during COVID. You're recently sober. How did you, how did you handle it? How did I mean, honestly, I think the book, the book is what 
you know, the project from multiple angles really helped me navigate, you know, the pandemic, especially the hardest part, which was 2020, um, yeah. you know, for me, for me personally, um, you know, when I, when I decided to write the book, I, I made three goals for myself. The first one was, com, you know, write the whole book, complete the project. You know, this wasn't a situation where I was like, I wanted to, you know, write a proposal and pitch it to publishers. And, you know, I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it so it would come out in 21 for the 25th anniversary. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to have some control over the content. And um, so I just, Set out, set out to do it and you know before i even looked into publishing um you know, i had a first draft and so my first goal was write the book complete the project um at least the first draft before i even dipped my toe in the publishing part and then the, the second goal was to get it published and i found a great company called scribe media um, which publishes mm -hmm. a lot of nonfiction, um and you know work worked with them um, to publish the book last fall. And then my third goal was just to help as many people as I could. And, you know, myself and at least one other person was, was my, my very, very low bar goal. Um, you know, and I know that that's happened. So, um, oh, yeah. now it's really just about, um, sh continuing to share my story and, and put the book out there as a resource and, you know, and hopefully, it'll help it'll help more people um it's so those are the goals helping. that i set thank you it's definitely and helping it, yeah by being on the podcast having your own podcast your own other podcast scribe media is pretty good at getting you guys on podcasts too because i think i'm yeah, pretty that's sure right. that's probably how they reach out to me all the time hey emily you yeah. gotta meet that person you gotta meet that person so they seem like yeah they're my my team with scribe was awesome from start to finish um so couldn't recommend them more highly if you're if you're looking to do something in the nonfiction space um but yeah i mean just to, to answer your to go back to your original question of you know setting those goals i mean really took me from father's day of 2020 through november 2nd of 2021 when the book was published and became an Amazon bestseller on the first day in multiple categories. And um, it was the same day the Braves won the World Series, which was awesome. Um, <laughs> wow, Atlanta had a know, big day. <laughs> yeah, couldn't, couldn't have anticipated that at all. <laughs> but, but, you know, it really took me, it, it was my pandemic. And it got all of my energy in, in the pandemic. Um, and, and was great. Like, I, I don't really know what, I mean, it was meant to happen that way. I just don't know what I would have done. Cause yeah, those first few months were, were a struggle, especially raising money for a nonprofit and feeling like, you know, every day your work was making sure to, that your, your teammates didn't get pay cuts or laid off. I mean, the, you know, those first few months were incredibly stressful. And, you know, once we got to a good place um, fundraising wise, going into June, you know, I had a little more energy to think about other things. And then, you know, again, I just had that epiphany on Father's Day that like, I need to go back to this idea of, you know, what would I see if my life flashed before my eyes and really start to build it out. And, um, you know, I made this, I, I love dates and I love time. Um, and my book really plays with time from that perspective. But I just made this big Excel sheet of like, 150 or so things from my life that could be a chapter. And okay. then I narrowed it down to, you know, about 120 that I was able to figure out the actual dates because the dates themselves are the chapter headings. It's not like chapter one, chapter two, it's the actual date. Um, and then I narrowed that down to, you know, to what's in the book um, and what I ended up writing. And, um, you know, and it was a great way to do it because it, it wasn't linear. It gave me the opportunity to, you know, if after work I wanted to write about this thing, then I just dug into that or, you know, I left some of the harder stuff till the end, and yeah. which I, 
finished my first draft Thanksgiving of 2020. And, um, you know, but it was a really approachable way to come to it where, you know, each chapter is kind of a standalone short story and it's organized in a way that has a story arc for sure and reiterates, you know, the points I'm trying to make. But, um, you know, I was able to tighten all that up you know, to make sure it connected well and the right order for things to be in. But when I was writing it, I wasn't thinking about the order. I was just thinking about telling the story inside of that chapter, um, you know, and it was just week by week. I did a little and, you know, did a little more as, as I got into the fall. And because um, the original idea was like, I wanted it to be out by my, my dad's anniversary in February. Um, which I know now, knowing how what it takes to actually publish a physical book, um, that that was that was silly. But yeah, you know, really. it it got me that tight timeline made me just focus so hard on that. And then and then when I found Scribe at the beginning of 2021, um, I did a crowdfunding campaign. The first time I've really used my fundraising skills, you know, for myself. Um, but did a crowdfunding campaign to help help fund the book. And, um, you know, that was sort of the first part of, of the year. And then between the end of February and mid-April was the, you know, the the second drafting and sort of locking that in and, and then going into the publishing process. And um, so it was a great experience and it, you know, it sort of was, was it was my pandemic. <laughs> so. What's next for you then? Because it's like, it's probably like this big thing and then and then now you're on shows and everything but like what's next it seems like a, a big goal like that is something that helps you keep moving forward yeah i think the next i mean i like i said i'm i'm thrilled about my new job i'm ready to to dig in there and um you know but i think the the podcast is suicide survival stories podcast will be more of a focus i mean i will do some book specific things. Um, but, you know, it's hard, it, it's hard to sit here and say, I wrote a memoir, but I did, I don't want it to be about me. But I kind of don't like I'm a more I'm more of a behind the scenes person. And so I created the podcast to be in conjunction with the book so that we can tell other people's stories. And so yeah. I think most of my effort moving forward will go into the podcast and figuring out how to um, you know, how to make time for that in addition to my new job and, and, and grow that. And, um, you know, but just to continue to speak up about suicidal ideation specifically, because I think that over the past 20 years for, you know, in wonderful ways, the conversation about mental health in general and anxiety and depression um, is a much more visible, accessible conversation but even still, until I really, until I was a couple months in, into writing this book, I, I'd been sharing about my anxiety and depression and those struggles on social media and being transparent and authentic about that for a decade. But until a couple months into writing this book, I had never said suicidal ideation connected to myself publicly. Um, I obviously knew that I needed to, to because of what I was doing. Um, but that's really my, my focus is, is changing the stigma around suicidal ideation, because if we don't, uh, again, it just goes back to that idea of, if we don't talk about suicidal ideation, it's just going to be poison. And so, you know, it is, even if it might be awkward for the person we're talking to, if it's staying in our head, it is far more poisonous. You know, if I'm telling you that I'm struggling with suicidal ideation, that is far healthier for the person struggling than them not telling you, you know? Yeah. And so that's where, but I think that's where society has to move, right? Because I think there are, there are fears and legitimate fears about the receiver of that information overreacting um and and so there's a balance there right um yeah. because i feel like i i've been visible enough 
I to this point to where I don't think anybody's going to overreact if I say I'm struggling, whether I say it publicly or one to one. Um, you know, but some people may really overreact and, you know, and take them to the emergency room or whatever. And and obviously there are different situations, right? Yeah. Like nothing nothing is monolithic. So should they not take is, them to the emergency room? This is the spectrum of situations, right? Yeah. There are some situations where it's da it, danger is apparent, mm -hmm. right? If danger is apparent, then yeah, of course. But if okay. I'm sitting down with you on a couch and just saying, yeah, you know, here's how I'm feeling. You know, I don't know what to do with this. I really wanted to talk about it. Like scooping me up and taking me to the hospital is over, is an overreaction, right? Yeah. Um, but if it's you know, if I if the if the person speaking is not well visibly, if they're manic, if they're you know threatening, yes. I mean, I think it's you know, I All think right. it's you know you know it when you see it, and I think it comes back to that like not making it about you, right? Yeah. If if you can see because of their words or tones or action that they are in danger then yes right help them but don't project danger onto them because what they're saying is scaring you got right? it got it so, that's a great way to end it because we're i'm sorry but we're we're kind of yeah, absolutely but let's talk about let's see this is how people can follow your book on instagram and twitter at dfky book right yep and then you also have this one which is uh share with suicide survival stories right that's yep. for instagram and twitter and then is this this is where they can listen to your podcast too and there's some resources there yeah the website yeah if you go to suicide survival stories.org it mm -hmm. gives you the option to if you want to buy the book go to amazon or um or if you don't do amazon um we're in the Ingram Spark catalog, so you could you could go to your local independent bookstore, which I which I recommend and support, um, and just ask them, and they can order the book for you. It's not going to be on the shelves because a lot of people have to request it before they put it you know put it on the shelves. Yeah. But they can you know it's in the catalog that they use to order from, and they can order it for you. But you can also buy it on Amazon um, or Barnes and Noble, different places. But if you go to Suicide Survival Stories dot org you get that option of going into the full website or going to buy the book um right. and so on the website it's pretty simple you know there's there's a section on the book with some selections and um there's a section for the podcast and then there's a section which you're you have here um for prevention resources and so okay. um you know and if there are resources that we can add um you know please email us at share at suicide survival stories.org. And um, we're trying, we're working right now to do a, do a big update to the um, resources page. So. Thank you very much for sharing your story and for writing this book, because definitely I, I know it's going to help people. And I know that it, it takes courage to come forward with your story. Um, and I just appreciate everything that you're doing. I hope that you're proud of yourself because you should be. I'm trying to be. <laughs> you, I, you know, be. I take cues from other people. So thank you for saying that. And, you know, and thank you for having me. It's It's been great to talk to you and share. Um, and I'm looking forward to connecting with folks through LinkedIn who are, have taken the time to listen. Yeah, you made a lot of new friends tonight. So um, <laughs> Hopefully you can set up some networking calls with them and just get to know this community. There's a lot of people that are very supportive um, that watch my show and, and other shows as well. So I'm going to put you in the green room and cool. I'll cool. be right there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. And thank you to everybody who watched this show. I greatly appreciate it. And next week I'll be live again. So I'm looking forward to that. I love doing this show. I am going to take like a break over the summer though. Not the whole summer, but a few, maybe a month or something like that, just so that 
I don't have to be like, oh, I'd love to, but I have a podcast interview on Wednesday night. I just want to have like a couple of uh, weeks where I have some free time. That's part of me creating a life I love living. So thank you for watching, for the comments, for reaching out to Jeff. I really appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week. I'll talk to you later. Onward Live is sponsored by Emily Harmon Coaching and Consulting. Visit my website, emilyharmon.com, to learn more about me and my coaching programs. I'd love to help you create a life you love living. Remember, every adversity is our own personal university. Sometimes the lessons are difficult, and we must learn from our experiences. Vulnerability is your superpower. You are lovable and worthy. And we discuss these topics and more because professional is personal. Thank you for joining us and engaging with me in 